I would now like to talk to you about achalasia, which is a disease process that involves the esophagus. Achalasia is a failure of organized esophageal peristalsis, causing impaired relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. This results in food stasis, and there is often marked dilatation of the esophagus. Obstruction of the distal esophagus from other non-functional etiologies, most notably malignancy, may have a similar appearance and has been termed secondary achalasia or pseudoachalasia. Connective tissue disorders, particularly scleroderma, can also mimic primary achalasia, but will be less severe and the GE junction will open normally. On conventional radiographs, there may be findings present that suggest the diagnosis of achalasia. A convex opacity overlying the right mediastinum. Occasionally, you may also see a leftward convexity if the thoracic aorta is tortuous. Air fluid levels due to stasis in the thoracic esophagus can be seen, and the esophagus can also be filled with retained secretions and food that may be visible radiographically. Uh, usually there's a smaller absent gastric bubble and on the lateral view you can see a distended posterior wall of the esophagus as well as bowing of the trachea. CT scans often performed for other indications may demonstrate dilated fluid filled esophagus. Typically, the diagnosis of achalasia is made predominantly by fluoroscopy, in particular esophagram utilizing barium as an oral contrast agent. Typical findings include what is termed the bird beak sign, which I will demonstrate in a later slide, caused by the lack of relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. The esophagus will be dilated. As I noted there will be incomplete relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter that is not coordinated with the esophageal contraction or peristalsis. There's pooling or stasis in the, in the esophagus when the esophagus has been become atonic or non-contractile. This is a late feature of the disease. In some cases you will see uncoordinated non-propulsive tertiary contractions there will be a failure of normal peristalsis to clear the esophagus when the patient is in the recumbent position. When the barium column is high enough, typically with the patient standing, the hydrostatic pressure of the retained fluid within the esophagus can overcome the lower esophageal sphincter pressure and allow passage of the esophageal contents. Achalasia is divided into three different distinct patterns. These patterns are based upon the manometric patterns obtained in the endoscopy lab. Type 1 is the classic type of achalasia with minimal contractility in the esophageal body. Type 2 has intermittent periods of pan esophageal pressurization or contraction, and type 3 is termed a spastic type of achalasia with premature spastic discoordinated distal esophageal contractions. As I mentioned previously, the differential of achalasia includes scleroderma. Chagas disease is seen in tropical uh, regions of the world, and also Anytime a dilated esophagus is encountered, the possibility of pseudochalasia secondary to an obstructing tumor must be excluded. Here is a chest radiograph demonstrating a dilated esophagus. The arrows on the left and right 
indicate shadows from a dilated esophagus, lateral chest radiograph documents a dilated esophagus distally as outlined by the arrows in the lower chest radiograph. On the upper aspect of the lateral view, it's noted that the tracheal air column is deviated anteriorly. This is a CT scan and a coronal projection of a patient with achalasia. In the middle of the image, there is a dilated tubular structure that represents the esophagus. You can see that there is mottled material present within the esophagus, which reflects ingest, ingested food. This is an image from a esophagram utilizing barium. You can see that the esophagus is dilated. In the lower aspect of the image, the dilated esophagus tapers abruptly to a sharp point or beak at the gastroesophageal junction. This is termed the bird beak sign. The arrow indicates the area of beaking or tapering at the lowest, uh, lower esophageal sphincter. Often the diagnosis is made with what is termed a timed esophagram. A timed esophagram is performed by administering a fixed amount of barium while the patient is in the upright position. Serial images obtained typically at one minute, two minutes, and five minutes. The diameter of the distended esophagus as well as the height of the barium column from the gastroesophageal junction is measured on these serial images. Most people will clear the esophagus by one minute and every normal patient will have complete emptying of the esophagus by five minutes. A column greater than two centimeters at five minutes is a specific finding of achalasia. Typically achalasia is treated with balloon dilatation to allow the lower esophageal sphincter to open. Other treatments include endoscopically guided Botox injections, oral administration of nifedipine acts to relax, to uh, decrease the tone of the lower esophageal sphincter and cause relaxation of the sphincter. In severe cases, myotomy or um, incision of the lower esophageal sphincter muscles can be performed here. This can be performed either endoscopically or surgically. Corkscrew esophagus or what is often referred to as spastic achalasia has a typical radiographic appearance. There are non-propulsive spasmodic contractions with no relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. These are two separate images from a barium esophagram that demonstrate a typical appearance of a corkscrew esophagus. As you can see, there are multiple indentations on the lumen due to multiple contractions. These contractions do not result in passage of barium and cause up and down to and fro movement of the barium column without emptying.